Hello, and welcome to episode five in my Piano to Orchestra series. I recently made a video of piano improvisations where I played through all of the piano VSTs that I own, and in the comments I asked if there were any improvisations from that video that you would like to see orchestrated. So today I'll be orchestrating one of those improvisations. First, I want to look at the improvisation and see if there are improvements that can be made to the composition before I start orchestrating. And before I forget, all of the MIDI files, Music XML, Dorico, Audio Stems, and Cubase file are available on my Patreon page. The link is in the description box below. Okay, so the first thing I did was to make a rough transcription of the improvisation. I'll play through the piano improvisation. For this one, I was using the Simple Sam Signature Grand Piano on the 90s JW setting. I assume that's supposed to be John Williams, but I'm not sure. I was definitely inspired by a particular Hollywood orchestral sound from the late 80s and early 90s. Not necessarily John Williams in particular. I'm thinking movies like An American Tale or Mrs. Doubtfire, any of those family-friendly movies from that era, especially ones that emphasized the Lydian scale. So that kind of sound was definitely in my head while improvising here, and I'll keep that sound in my head when orchestrating. I'll play through this first, then talk about it. Back to the beginning, a few things I noticed. The first seven measures are introductory, then there's a motive right here that can serve as a main motive in the piece. It features that sharp four, which is exactly what I want. The problem is that I moved to the next idea too quickly, this idea that moves to a B flat major chord. I should probably repeat the first idea before moving on. When I improvise, I'm not always thinking about form and repetition, so usually after the fact, I have to sort that stuff out. So I'll make a note of that section. Moving on here, I sort of repeat the introduction material, though it's a bit more interesting melodically. Then I return to the B flat major chord with a slightly different melodic idea. That's okay that it's a bit different than what came before. In fact, I'm noticing an interesting contour difference. Notice that the first B flat chord melodic idea started high and descended, the second time I go to that chord, I start lower and ascend. I don't think I was consciously aware of that in the moment, but I kind of like that it's there. Okay, so another problem I notice, too, actually. First, I played an F natural here when I meant to play F sharp to keep it in Lydian. But the greater problem is that the motive feels like a big climactic moment, and yet it's a melody that I didn't play before, probably because I tend to forget things that I played only moments earlier. In hindsight, though, at this point in the piece, it would be a great opportunity to bring back that original motive for measure 8. Other than that, I think the rest is fine. Overall, it's a bit short to be a full cue, so maybe later on I'd add or repeat large sections to make it more substantial. I'm not going to do that today, however. So I'll play through the piano version once more, this time with corrections and improvements that I made. Instead of talking through those changes, I've just written some comments on the page.
So as you could hear, I made a few changes to improve the overall form, nothing major. Now on to orchestrating. I'm just going to make one version today. This piece is already too long to make multiple orchestrations. I spent a bit of time listening to some of those 90s film scores that I mentioned, and a lot of them used piano pretty heavily, so I think I'll try and do the same. The other thing that I picked up on when listening to them is that the orchestrations are pretty simple and straightforward. So there's no reason for me to get too adventurous with this. I want to start by talking about the form of the orchestration. This is something that I always think about before orchestrating, and it's a really important step in my process for making effective orchestrations. There are several sections to this piece. By sections, I mean parts of the form, like the introduction, a main theme, a contrasting theme or transition, a return to the main theme, more contrasting or transitional music, and a bit of cadential climactic music that ends this entire section. I can then start writing down orchestration ideas, like instruments or combinations of instruments that I might want to use. And I don't necessarily have to start orchestrating right at the beginning. I often tell my students to try orchestrating at the biggest, loudest section first. Then you have a better sense of where you're going when you start to work on the beginning. But this piece is short enough that I'll just start right at the beginning. In this introduction, I want the timbre to be delicate, light, and soft. I think piano, harp, celeste, maybe some shimmery percussion might be nice. Then when the main melody comes in, I want to maintain a fairly light and delicate timbre with piano on that main melody. Maybe those same instruments from before on backgrounds, and maybe some string sustains or tremolos as well. Then after the main theme, I want to have a sense that the texture is building so I'll continue to add more instruments, and strings and upper winds can carry that melodic part. The shimmery instruments like harp and percussion can continue, but they won't be as present now. The next brief transition section, I hear a solo horn on this line, so I think it'll be the first time I use brass. Also, there's a very obvious lead-in to the return of the main theme. This is a moment where I can orchestrate a crescendo. In other words, all the instruments are sort of building or appear and then grow into the climactic moment. So that return to the main theme, I hear this melody in horns and upper strings and octaves with celli and bassoons playing the arpeggiated line below. I'll have the rest of the brass on backgrounds and upper winds playing flourishes with harp and xylophone. I'll probably add some suspended cymbals and bass drum hits as well. Then the overall dynamics and density will come back down in the second contrasting transition melodic area. I think violas, cellos, clarinets might be nice with horns on background harmonic support. Finally, the texture builds one last time with the entire orchestra building, strings, winds, trumpets even on the melody, and low winds and strings on the arpeggios with low brass on sustains. So this kind of outline that I've just made gives me a better sense of the overall density and the texture and how those textures evolve and grow over time. Let's dive into that introduction now. Of those instruments listed, I like piano and harp on the eighth notes. They can both be very soft and delicate. I've also given piano these whole notes here in place of eighth notes. I noticed that I didn't include a tonic F at all in this introduction, so otherwise this whole section could be misheard as A minor. Here's what these instruments sound like together. So I have that original piano part shown above, arranged between two instruments, but the texture needs some other shimmery element to make it a bit more magical sounding. So I'll add some percussion as well as celeste. I prefer celeste here as more of a coloring tool, just to add some additional color as a background instrument. So here you can see I've added a very simple celeste part. It actually outlines that F Lydian scale that I'm using for this entire piece. I've also added percussion instruments that share one thing in common. They're all metallic and shimmery. Bell trees are generally pretty soft, so I really only use them in cases where there's little else happening. And suspended cymbal and triangle just help to set the piece in motion ever so gently. Let's hear the combination of these instruments.
So I like how this is sounding, but I thought it was a little too thin. I don't need another eighth note or flourishy instrument, but I thought that tremolo violin sustains might help, and they provide an additional shimmery element. And to thin out the violins, I'm having them play Debussy chords. So I'm happy with that introduction, now on to the first statement of the theme. I've already established that I want this in piano, so here's the piano part. Notice that I've changed the left hand. Instead of eighth notes, I have it alternating quarter and half notes for the first four measures here, roughly in the same location registrally though. I think I did this to make the piano part a little calmer, less active during this section. It's the main melody. I want it to sound delicate, calm, tender, all of those things and I'll let some of the other instruments have the shimmery motion. Speaking of that shimmery motion, I decided instead of the eighth note ostinato pattern, I'd achieve a similar effect with harp tremolos using a technique called bisbigliando. In the main title track from American Tale, James Horner uses, I think, mandolin tremolos in a similar way. So I was definitely mimicking that here with the harp. Notice that even though these harp chords are whole notes, I've still tried to create interesting voice leading, implying a contour in both the top and bottom notes for measure to measure. Really gives this music a sense of direction. I'll add back in those instruments that were present in the first seven measures, so that's celesta, violins, and also add vibraphone playing long notes. And in the second four measures here, I've doubled the moving eighth note part with second violins, very light staccato sound. Might actually be a good idea to mark this as leggero in the score to indicate a lighter sound. And I've added viola divisi sustains below them, so I'm very slowly expanding the register down. Let's hear just these instruments, strings, and percussion. Notice that in the original piano version shown above, I actually have the melody in octaves in the second four measures. Might be a good idea to support this melody with other instruments, considering I've been bringing in more background instruments over time. I need to make sure that the melody is still in the foreground. So I'll add a few woodwinds. How about a flute and oboe on the melody in octaves? And then two clarinets and a bassoon on harmony notes below them. I've taken the notes from the harp part, so I'm reinforcing the bit of voice leading with the bassoon ascending by step in each chord. Here are just the winds playing these four measures. And putting that all together, here are these eight measures with everyone playing. On to the next section. This is the first transition section, and I wanted there to be a sense that the whole texture is growing towards something. So in terms of density and number of instruments, I want a slightly thicker texture than what came before, even though this isn't the main melody anymore. I want more instruments, but still relatively quiet compared to what's to come. So here are the instruments on the melodic part. I have a piccolo, two oboes, and first violins. Piccolo is fairly low in its range, so it's not gonna be overpowering. In fact, it's going to be pretty quiet and gentle. In measure 23, I expand the register and density by adding in flutes and dividing the first violins in half in octaves. Since these four measures repeat the previous four measures, it's nice to do something slightly different orchestrationally to expand on the first iteration. 
Here's what these instruments sound like. I have two other layers happening during these measures. First, the syncopated line from the left hand of the piano, and also a background counter line that I've written. This wasn't in the original piano score. So here I'm showing low winds, marimba, piano, harp, and all the strings except first violins. These are all the background parts. First bassoon, second violins, harp, and piano have the eighth note texture initially, then bassoon drops out, and marimba and clarinets join in starting in measure 19. Finally, when I expand the texture going into measure 23, just piano and marimba have the line verbatim. However, if you look closely at what the bassoons, clarinets, and strings have, you'll see that the basic idea from that eighth note figure is arranged throughout these instruments. Together, their parts form sort of a compound gesture based on the arpeggiated eighth note figure. Going back to measure 16, there's also a counter melodic figure that I've given to violas and clarinets. It's really just background material, but there's a pause here in the main foreground melody at that measure, and so there was an opportunity for something in the background to be slightly more melodic. Here's what all of these background parts sound like together. Putting this section all together, here's what it sounds like. On to the next brief section, this is a transition into the main theme again. I definitely wanted that horn timbre on the melody, but I think I'll double it with clarinets and violas. I give them all a crescendo, and I add in second horn in measure 29. I'll play everyone here. You'll see I have upper strings and winds join in on that line in measure 29 as well, all leading into the big downbeat at measure 31. Here's what these four measures sound like. All right, onto the fun part. Here's the return of the main theme. Instead of breaking this down by melody and background instruments, I'll break it down into sections. First, the string section. I have violins and violas spanning three octaves here on the main theme. I recently made a video on what to do with second violins, and I showed an excerpt from a piece by Samuel Barber that used upper strings in this exact configuration to get that soaring, sweeping melodic sound. So I'll use that here. I then have cellos divided in two, with the upper division playing the arpeggios from the left hand on the original piano version. The lower division of cellos stain with basses, and finally harp sort of has those same cello arpeggios, plus some right hand glissandi. Here's what the string section sounds like. Then in the brass, we finally get a full brass section playing, four horns on the melody in unison, and the rest of the brass section is voiced relatively low, but the trumpets are ascending. So by the end of this section, they really make their presence felt. Here's what the section sounds like. Okay, onto the woodwinds. This definitely took the most time to sort out because I wanted the flourishes from the upper winds. Piccolo, flutes, oboes, and clarinets are all on these flourishes, mostly in octaves, although occasionally I have them in thirds as well. I might have to make a separate video on my process for writing these kinds of woodwind parts, so let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in seeing that. I will say it's easier than it looks. It's really just a question of figuring out where the line is going and then dealing with the registral restrictions of instruments. 
Aside from the flourishes, I have bassoons doubling on that cello part, but split up between two bassoonists. Here's what the wind section sounds like. And here's the entire orchestra on this section. There's some additional percussion like suspended cymbal, bass drum, and xylophone doubling on the flourishes. I'm going to combine the last two sections into one. This is another transition or contrasting section that ends with cadential motion. I'll look first at the string section again. The passage starts with violas and celli sharing the melody with violas on the top part and cellos below. Basses are sustaining low notes below celli. Then violins sneak in to join violas on the final phrase and octave above. Both violins are in unison. Cellos have the arpeggiated material again and harp is kind of doing its own thing here. Although the first few measures of the harp part are similar to upper woodwinds, so I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, let's hear the strings. The brass section remains very present in these final measures. The horns begin as backgrounds to that viola and cello melody, then the rest of the brass section enters and builds towards the final four measures. Trumpets actually have the melody in octaves too, doubling those upper strings. And horns, I gave a counter melodic gesture that wasn't in that piano part. I added it because I felt like there needed to be something interesting happening in the background, more interesting than just the sustains. So here's what the brass section sounds like. Finally, the woodwinds. Flutes start by doubling that harp part, then join in on the melody in the last four measures. Clarinets are mostly doubling violas, and bassoons are doubling celli, with contrabassoon doubling basses. Here's what they sound like together. And here's the full orchestra together on this final section. Okay, so I'll finally put the entire piece together and play it through. I'll show the MIDI this time as there's really only room on the page for either the score or the MIDI view, and up until now I've shown the score. So here's the complete orchestration from start to finish. Hopefully I achieved my goal of trying to mimic that late 80s or early 90s family-friendly film score sound. Obviously both the composition itself and the orchestration are both important in trying to mimic a particular genre or style. You can't just have one or the other. Okay, so here it is. I hope you enjoy.
hope you've enjoyed this episode. Remember, the MIDI file, Music XML file, Dorico file, Cubase file, and audio stems are all available on my Patreon page. I'd love for you to check them out. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.